Our next uh, speaker will be introduced by uh, Mr. Howard Lords. It is my privilege to introduce a man who is well-known author and journalist. Otto Scott and I have been acquainted for some time now. Let me see, it's almost 10 o'clock. That makes about an hour and a half, I guess. <laughs> but seriously, I've become acquainted with Mr. Scott through his various books and the articles he has written, just as I am sure many of you have. Otto first started his career as a crime reporter for a newspaper in the middle 30s. Later, he worked as a journalist for United Press. After that, he worked as an ad agency executive for Ashland Oil, as many of you may know as Valvoline. Otto has written a number of books which have had a profound effect on many of his readers, including myself. He has written about the lives of four men in separate volumes which will comprise a quartet that Otto refers to as the sacred fools of history. The first book in the series to come out was called Robespierre, The Voice of Virtue. This stunning book documents the real-life antics of the French revolutionary leader from his rise to power to his hasty decline via the guillotine. This is an excellent book with many striking parallels to be found in our own society today. Unfortunately, this book is no longer in print. The second book to appear was entitled James I. It documents the life of a high Renaissance man and his desire to destroy Christianity and replace it with a cult of man. A strange position for the man who authorized the King James Version of the Bible. Unfortunately, this book was not picked up when the publishing house of Mason and Charter sold out to another company and is now also out of print. The third book in the series is entitled The Secret Six and documents the life of the terrorist John Brown. Six highly placed and well-known people of the 1800s set up a fund of guns, money, and support to back Brown in his obsession to rid the nation of slavery. This was one of the first times in our nation where innocent people were killed to make a political point. This book helps the reader to fully understand some of the real forces behind the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson is the fourth book yet to be published and shows the culmination of folly. The reader should know why he, should know why he is, where he is, after reading these four books. He should be able to recognize the fools of the future by observing the fools of the past four centuries. Not a bad quartet for a guy who didn't even graduate from high school. It's with great honor I introduce to you author, journalist, and best of all, Christian Reconstructionist, Otto Scott. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's true, I'm a high school dropout. But I was in high school briefly, and I recall during that first year that an author came through to give a lecture. His name was Raphael Sabatini. His books were very popular in the 1930s. He wrote Scaramouche, Captain Blood, and a great many other historical novels. Very, very interesting and exciting. Now, anyone who is that popular an author today would not lecture or appear in a high school because, uh, well, the reading tastes of high schools have changed. <laughs> They wouldn't be reading historical novels. They'd be reading Judy Bloom. <laughs> but at that time, Mr. Sabatini was very well known. And I recall that Hollywood put many of his novels into film. Uh, Errol Flynn played Captain Blood, which, as I look back on it, was not inappropriate. <laughs> and... Uh, some other very well-known actors in the, of the day played in Scaramouche. I can't recall their names, but they were big people. And what Sabatini discussed 
when he arrived at the Newburgh Free Academy along the Hudson was the difference between real history and the sort of history that he portrayed in his novels. He described, I recall, the some of the aspects of the 18th century in which I don't remember, of course, everything that he said, but a few things stick. He mentioned body lice. <laughs> Everyone had them. Even society ladies, they had ivory back scratchers that they would operate with no matter where. And he had some other comments that opened our eyes. And the point that I absorbed from his lecture was that you can't believe everything you read. And in time, I was to discover that historians who are presented as being great scholars are often just as good writers of fiction as Raphael Sabatini was. <laughs> and I also discovered that a great many people uh, do not appreciate the truth about the past, or are the truth, for that matter, about the present. They don't like to have their illusions shattered. When my historical books appeared, some of my best friends immediately flew to their encyclopedia to check on what I had written. And then they called me up to tell me that what I had written was not the same as was in the encyclopedia. And, of course, that proved something. It proved that encyclopedias tell lies. <laughs> I said that to them, but uh, I could sense their skepticism even over the phone. <laughs> even though I footnoted everything I wrote. And I discovered that that particular sort of skepticism is especially true of people in the media. My assessment of James I of England is that he was an odious man, really an evil fellow. And a young reporter in Oklahoma City said, my college t teachers didn't tell me that. And he got very angry with me. It was as though I had said to him that his four years of struggle to get through college had been a waste of time. He wasn't going to forgive me for that. And yet, when it comes to history, this is generally true in the United States. We have all been misinformed. We've been led down the garden path. I was taught, and I think most of you were taught, that the original Enlightenment in France, in 18th century France, was a great leap forward in terms of culture and political understanding. Voltaire was a great man. Diderot's encyclopedia was a marvelous production. Rousseau was a great writer and philosopher. But the truth is that Voltaire was a rabid anti-Semite Diderot's encyclopedia was packed with unscientific nonsense that was nonsense, and they knew it was nonsense even when they wrote it. Rousseau's theories about primitive societies were ignorant and biased. Most of the enlighteners, which is a term they gave themselves, <laughs> who lived to see the revolution, proved their inability to analyze events and politics by the fact that they were conveyed to ignominious death under the guillotine. I wouldn't say that the fate of that elite was unprecedented. A great many coteries have suffered for their errors. But very few circles have enjoyed the wonderful press 
lasting almost 200 years that the members of the French Enlightenment have received. One of their number, Champour, a writer, hailed the revolution as the culmination of all hopes and dreams. Now that was a bit strange because he had done very well under the monarchy and so did most of his associates. Just before the king fell, Champfort was mentioned for a diplomatic post. In 1793, he was arrested, and Robespierre pretended not to know him. Released, he spoke against the guillotine and was rearrested and put in prison. Released the second time, a police agent whose expenses he had to pay was assigned to stay with him at all times. Chamfort continued to make bitter comments about the course of the revolution and especially about the leaders. And one day the agent ordered him to pack up and said, I'm taking you back to prison. Chamfort had sworn not to go back to prison. So he walked into his library and shut the door, locked the door, picked up a pistol, shot himself in the forehead. His aim was poor. <laughs> And the bullet smashed his nose and burst one eye. Surprised to be still alive, he took a razor and tried several times to cut his throat. But his hand shook. In his agitation, he missed the aorta. He tore his flesh to ribbons. Then he cut both wrists and opened all his veins. And finally, overcome with pain, he cried out and collapsed in a chair while the blood flowed under the door. The housekeeper heard him. People came running. They broke down the door and tried to staunch his blood with all sorts of cloth, handkerchiefs, and whatever. Carried him to bed. And his friends rallied around him. He was there when the police arrived. The authorities offered to place four guards around his bed, for which he would have to pay. <laughs> To everyone's surprise, he recovered <laughs> and moved to a cheap room with a single guard. <laughs> Later, he developed a fever, various ailments, and finally the doctors came in and performed a very belated operation, but it was too late, and he died. His obituary was printed without comment. And his position was such that it took some courage to attend the funeral. Almost all the people who were invited did attend. That was the end of the man who said, Do you think that revolutions are made with rose water? His mistake was that he didn't realize that he was helping a revolution to come about until it engulfed him. And much the same could be said about his associates in the French Enlightenment. They didn't really know what they were doing. Now, however, we have had a chance to see that sort of operation, not only then, but many, many times since then. So we don't have the same uh, excuse. We know how these catastrophes are created. And we know from contemporary events, not from our education, because our teachers didn't describe the enlightenment of France properly. They didn't give us the real background. They didn't tell us that the enlightenment really began in England in the period between 1660 and the mid-1700s. And it began in part as a reaction to the Cromwellian Revolution. It consisted in the beginning of a wave of ridicule against the more eccentric members of the Puritan forces, and it escalated into a great avalanche of ridicule and wit and sarcasm against religion and Christianity in general. <laughs> 
That ridicule was part of the restoration when Charles II came back to England. And for a time it looked as though it was going to carry the English into a total paganism because the English, like the Italians in the Italian Renaissance at that period, had rediscovered the pagan writings of ancient Rome and Greece. And these writings, of course, provide a much different view of the world than does Christianity. All sorts of archaeological efforts were launched in England, and the scholars began to demand that the Bible be scientifically investigated. One young scholar who was swept into this scientific re-examination of the past was Edward Gibbon, who decided to write the history of the decline of Rome. As he said, I sat musing amidst the ruins of the capital while the barefooted friars were singing vespers in the Temple of Jupiter. Of course, the Temple of Jupiter had been abandoned a long time ago and was being used as a Christian church. But it was interesting that Gibbon still called it the Temple of Jupiter. At that point, that was about 1764, Voltaire was old, but as a young man he had visited London and had become acquainted with this ridicule of Christianity, and he carried the fashion back with him to Paris. His earliest writings began then, in which he ridiculed the flood, the martyrs, the story of creation, priesthood, and all the rest. That's where he picked it up. And about all that kept England from the abyss, in that period, was, John, was the Wesley brothers in the Great Revival. Evangelists. Evangelists saved them. Otherwise, they would have gone into the same cataclysm at, as the one that overtook the French. Of course, there were some Americans who were affected at the time, notably Benjamin Franklin, uh, and some of the, many of the English, Thomas Paine, who came over here, wonderful, wonderfully gifted journalist, famous atheist. Franklin and Paine are still listed in my unabridged Webster's as the leaders of the Enlightenment in America, which you won't get in school either. Now, all that may sound a long way from the Victorians, but that's really only a matter of one generation and a short jump from the French Revolution to Victoria. Dr. Rush Dooney has an interesting book about Victoria, disputing the legend that she was a prude and never laughed. She was a member of the House of Hanover, which produced a long line of dissolute people. She enjoyed a body story, but not before children. Manners, not behavior, were what mattered most to the Victorians. Dr. Peter Gay, a professor of history at Columbia, scholar, who subtitled his work on the French Enlightenment, The Rise of Modern Paganism, has recently published a book about the Victorians stressing their misconduct. And of course, we were taught that they were very repressed so to speak, but it seems they were not. They were merely careful to draw a distinction between what was public and what was private. The English upper class in the Victorian period, for instance, was noted for its adulteries, its mistresses and lovers, its swapping of partners at great country houses, its great trove of secret pornography. But if this misbehavior is escaped the knowledge of the upper class and descended to the divorce courts or the newspapers, those involved were ostracized and disgraced. In other words, it was not what was done, but what was known and by whom it was known. In part, this was a reflection of pagan teaching and especially of the writings of Plato. Plato. 
Plato's guardian in the Republic, you remember, were supposed to rule society. And these guardians in Plato's utopia were to share their women, but this was to be kept from the common people. Any public disgrace could cost a guardian his position. And any public disgrace would cost a member of the English upper class his position in the 19th century. Adultery was forgivable so long as the class lines were maintained. Now, before England reached that stage, it had undergone a tremendous series of changes. First, the Napoleonic Wars, which lasted 20 years, and during their duration, there was a great revulsion against the arguments of the French Revolution. But social changes were deferred during that long period of fighting, and when the war was over, many of these changes came rushing because in the course of the war there had been an industrial revolution. Wars usually provoke that sort of reaction. And industries, railroads, cheap textiles, all sorts of innovations began to appear. And in turn, these technical innovations led to social developments. All but the very fringes of society began to experience an increase in their living standard. All sorts of new rich people began to appear who had neither aristocratic connections nor political uh, status. The private sector, which in the old days had really consisted mainly of tradesmen and craftsmen and uh, relatively minor merchants, began to expand into very large enterprises, into factories, large-scale employment, and so forth. Uh, this <coughs> also led, you might say, to the development of the scientific outlook, which Dr. Rushduni referred to earlier. It permeated all classes of society. The Reverend Malthus, who doubted God's wisdom in allowing people to have so many 